So there's a wild card leading into this presidential election, young voters. This demographic usually stays home, but they could make all the difference in this year's presidential election. In this episode of Culture Conversations, we speak with Ms. Tiffany Lofton. She's the National Director for the NAACP Youth and College Division about their final push. So we're just days away from the election and this last and final push. Can you talk a little bit about what the NAACP is doing in this home stretch? And for those who don't know, can you talk a little bit about what you do and how you've been working to get out the votes? So um, I've been with the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, commonly known as the NAACP, for almost three years now. I serve as the National Director of Youth in College. What that looks like is I have 360 chapters across the country. Everybody that's Black in the NAACP under the age of 24 works with me on training, leadership development, and civic engagement. NAACP, you gotta fight if you wanna be free. We're working with young leaders across the country so that they are on campus mobilizing voters, setting them voter education uh, guides, making sure that they're registered, that they're checking their voter registration status, that they know where to go to make sure that they can cast their vote, or if they're turning it in by mail, that they know where to drop it off at. And uh, and we're also dealing with our students who are at school during this national pandemic, making sure that folks stay safe and uh, encouraging the young vote to turn out. Show me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. And speaking of young people, I know this is, I want to ask you about something you recently said, and I'm paraphrasing though. Um, yeah, our yeah. young folks are, they're more woke. They're having more important conversations than we were when we were younger, um, which is true. Um, but talk to me about why you think that is. The young people that I work with now who are uh, l younger than the voting age, they're 15, 14, you know, they're in middle school, they're leading their NAACP chapters. Those young people have just as much proximity to the uh, police violence, to racial injustice, to the economic downturn, to the health disparities and the over 220,000 people in the country who have been killed by coronavirus. They know these statistics, they know these facts. This is their everyday lived experience. So the reason why I think they're more woke is because their proximity to the information is faster. Their proximity to the information forces them to have an analysis about the world and how it's operating and to imagine a world that they wanna live in where they don't have to live under violence or fear. And so those young people who are asking those questions are the same young people who put their bodies on the line this summer to march in the streets after the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. No justice, no peace. And Rashard Brooks and Tony McDade and the list goes on. And so uh, my job as an organizer, as a national civil rights organizer, is to make sure that when people get woke, when they feel charged and they go out into the streets, that's not where they stop their activism and protests. That they join an organization on the local or statewide level to then foster their leadership to move some of these agenda items. And it's not just through November 3rd, it continues thereafter to continue to do the organizing. But the important thing I think that's different in the 2020 election is people making the election more personal. When we're saying justice for Breonna Taylor, people are not just saying, let's hold the police accountable. They're also saying, wait a minute, something where is the vote and the civic engagement strategy in the fight for justice for Breonna Taylor? And it landed at the attorney general. People were asking the question, well, what does the attorney general do? What's his name? How did he get elected? When is his next election so we can vote him out? The conversation continues. And so that is our angle to make this issue personal so that when people recognize you protest in the street, that is just one way to show up on your activism. The vote is necessary. It's not sufficient but it is necessary to do just as, just as much. President Obama appointed you as an advisor on black educational matters in 2013, and he encouraged you to run for office. So talk to me about the importance of black politicians on all levels of, of government. This is a great question. I was 21 or 22 when I had uh, my meeting in the Oval Office with President Barack Obama. And, you know, being a, a young girl from Gardena, who went to Birmingham High School. I went to Madison Middle School. I went to Valerio Elementary. Uh, I, I never, ever thought in my wildest dreams that that would even be a space that a young Black woman like me had the opportunity to uh, interact with the first Black president of the nation. And that was not only significant because he was the first Black president, 
But it was also my first election when I was 18 years old to vote was for President Barack Obama. And so the whole, the whole civic circle turned around with that opportunity. We don't often see ourselves in politics. And a lot of times politics and policy are intimidating. I work with a lot of young people across the country. And I remember being that young person that was like, wait a minute, you want me to meet with my elected official? What am I supposed to, I'm gonna, I don't know what to say. Like, I don't know how to advocate for myself. What is their job? And, and I don't remind myself enough that they work for us. And so that relationship to elected officials, one, can be very intimidating for young people. And two, just like with teachers or any profession, if you don't see yourself in the profession, then you don't think that profession belongs to you or that it's accountable to you and that you know how to navigate that system. And so having black elected officials, especially young black elected officials, is so significant to our experience when we talk about what's best for our communities, because you can see like the mayor in Compton, or you can see uh, uh, Stacey Abrams in Georgia running for governor, or you can see the list of other young black women um, who are running for office, who are currently in office, who can inspire the other young folks and say, wait a minute, you're like me. <laughs> and now we can have a relationship to advocate for that agenda. It's the same thing with the first black president. And now a, the, for the first time ever, the vice presidential candidate who was a black woman, who's also an AKA, who also went to an HBCU. When we open and break down those doors, it just makes the proximity and advocacy so much easier for young people to get engaged in civic engagement and to be full participating Americans. Now, are you finding that a lot of young people, though, are willing to consider a, a commitment to civil service right now? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I, I tell my students that sometimes um, our issues choose us and sometimes we choose our issues. I think 2020 chose us. And so what I'm finding now is not only are young people upset, not only are they uh, disappointed, not only are they uh, uh, discouraged from watching who they thought they could trust make the wrong decisions for their future, but I'm finding now that they're not only, they're very, this generation, Generation Z is very different. They are not going to wait till November 3rd to demand change. They don't want to just follow the processes or the ask that people have them to protest peacefully, right? They're not the ones who are going to say, well, we're going to sit by it and hope that you make the right decision on behalf of our communities. These young folks are like, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to vote. And also, we're going to show up in the streets. We're going to donate. We're going to change our avatar. We're going to have conversations to bring awareness. We're going to fact check everything. We're going to build strong organizations. We're going to lead. We're going to go on TV. We're going to talk to the media. We're going to write papers. Their, their list of things that they are excited and moved to do. And what I have learned being a 31 year old millennial is I, my job is to give them the training and the resources that they need so that they can be the best versions of leaders that they want to be. So let's talk about the current race for the White House. President Trump is making an appeal to black men to get their vote. And to some extent, it appears to be working. The polls show that his support among um, young black voters is going up. So why do you think that is? Actually, two questions here. Why do you think that is? And why young black men? Um, I'll answer the second question first. Why do I think he's reaching out to young black men? I think it's very intentional to divide the base of people that we have right now to turn out for a, a certain um, white supremacist agenda that started a long time ago, but has been uh, magnified in the last four years. There is a, uh, a battle right now for power. And they know that black people turn out to the polls. They know that we understand how important our vote is. They know that we understand how important black women are to the electorate. And they also know how important young people are. Generation Z and millennials make up 37% of the electorate right now. We are outnumbering the baby boomers. So if you are smart and you were running for president, of course you're gonna try to talk to young black people. And of course you're gonna try to talk to young black men. That strategy is not lost upon either party, I think. Now their approach to doing it is problematic, but their desire to do it is smart. Now, what that means is this. We understand what it means when black men are targeted on all levels, whether it be politically or whether it be by police. 
And so what we have been doing at the NAACP is working with Black men organizers across the country to not only have safe and bold conversations about the elections and what Black men need, but we've also been working with Black men so that they can actually volunteer to be poll workers across the country. We're partnering with this organization called Black Men Build, which is led by a bunch of really incredible folks, including Philip Agnew. Uh, we partnered with a gentleman named Bruce Franks, who was a former state representative in Missouri, who, yeah, I love Bruce Franks. He's also Oscar nominated for his movie, Superman. He's gonna love that I shouted him out because he's amazing. And um, we work with these Black men and a bunch of other Black men across the country to, to charge Black men to sign up with the NAACC, NAACP, sign up with Black Men Build to show up to the polling locations to fight against intimidation, to fight against the violence that's going to be there. We, we, we see now in the news reporting that uh, foreign countries are meddling in our elections, scaring voters, that people have burned mail, uh, ballot, mail ballot box collectives, that they have uh, been, been showing up to polling locations to scare voters away. And that is not democracy. That's not democracy. That's not America. And so Black men are partnering with us in our program to be poll workers, to volunteer to hold these conversations and to show up in person to make sure that people feel safe and have what they need to cast their ballots safely, fairly in this democratic process that we all claim we have. And lastly, I wanna ask you about a tweet. You recently tweeted that the people we need to reach, they're not on IG, they're not on Zoom, um, they're outside. What did you mean by that? There is a, an apparatus of organizations that do vote work. There is a um, tradition of how parties, elected officials, celebrities work to turn out voters through messaging. And I think that we get really comfortable thinking that if we do enough lives, and we do enough polls, and we go viral enough, that we will cover all of our bases. And I have this deep conviction that I'm going to do everything in my power as a national director and as a black woman and as a millennial in DC to make sure that I work to turn out as many voters as possible before November 3rd in the next couple of days. And I will not be successful in that conviction if I do not go outside and meet with the people. It will be horrific if we get to the upside of this election. And it's not about a presidential candidate. This is a, across the board because there's so much on the ballot, right? It, it'll be problematic and it'll be disappointing to get to November 4th and wake up and say, I wish I could have done more because it'll be too late. We will not get this do over again. So I offered that message to people across the country, to my, to my followers, to my network, to say, don't forget and don't get lazy and don't get comfortable. The upcoming election is one that is vital to our democracy, critical to ensuring fairness and equality for all. Culture Conversations has assembled a panel of political experts, people with knowledge and expertise in election systems, voting rights, constitutional law, and more for a closer look at the issues. Over the next several weeks, they will provide background, insight, and context, all in the hopes that it helps to inform you of your choice when you confront the ballot. Our panel includes Gloria Brown Marshall, a constitutional law professor at J. John College of Criminal Justice, an expert frequently tapped to provide commentary on national news programs. Kristen Clark, president of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, a national civil rights organization laser focused on equal justice in housing, civil rights, and voting. Bilal Saku is a board member of Common Cause, the nonpartisan grassroots organization dedicated to American democracy. Dr. Sekou also teaches political science at the University of Hartford. And Vanessa Tyson is a political science professor at Scripps College. Dr. Tyson's work primarily focuses on Black Americans and the political system and women and public policy. Um, the president is constantly talking about voter fraud, but how big of an issue is it really? Voter fraud is, I mean, you, you can go to any number of think tanks, including and including studies that have been commissioned by President Trump himself, and you'll find that voter fraud is extraordinarily rare. Um, you know, something like 
30 cases out of 23.5 million votes cast. Voter fraud basically occurs not just less than 1% of the time, it's less than one one thousandth of a percent of the time. There's a greater chance that you will be struck by lightning uh, than see uh, voter fraud happen uh, in our country. It is exceedingly rare, but it's kind of the go-to justification used by people who want to push and tout voter suppression tactics. Um, what the reality is that, you know, over 100 million eligible Americans did not vote in 2016. And when you compare the United States to other modern democracies across the globe, we have sadly among the lowest voter, voter participation and turnout rates. And it's because uh, we're constantly in some parts of the country just bent on making it hard, hard for people to exercise their voice. Uh, so there is no real vote fraud, but what there is are very significant uh, barriers and burdens and hurdles that people have to cross in order to vote. And speaking of voter suppression, what kind of voter suppression tactics are we seeing in 2020 from purging voter rolls to voter ID laws? What are you seeing? Well, we have the traditional his historic um, types of voter suppression, and that is voter intimidation. Um, the Donald Trump and conservatives have uh, actually budgeted $20 million for poll watchers. And these poll watchers are people who are loyal to the Republican Party, who are at the polls, and some people said have been intimidating them. And um, it's, there have actually been police calls and, or other um, ways in which they've told these people that you can't just lurk around um, the polls deciding who should be able to vote. That's not what a poll watcher is supposed to be officially doing. And you also have people um, who are purged from the voting um, rolls who don't know it until they arrive to vote. And that's why vote.org, a non-partisan um, um, entity, vote.org, is a place to check your voter registration and to register to vote. We have in Florida something that is a quasi-historical and kind of new way of, of suppressing the vote. And that is people who have felony convictions, which has been an historical way to keep certain people from voting, are not allowed to vote in certain states but they gain that right to vote until they pass another law saying in Florida that unless they pay their um, fines that came along with the sentence that they serve, they are not allowed to vote. And so that's been a, a kind of a 21st century poll tax. Another pattern that we've seen in the last few years is uh, purging of the voter rolls. And that's when voters are, you know, voters' names are, are just deleted from from the system without their knowledge um it's not because they passed away it's not because you know they they moved it's simply you know because maybe they didn't vote in the prior election but when talking about these suppression efforts who are the people most impacted so disproportionately what we've seen is that it, it's black and brown people you know the black community the latinx community um, elderly individuals who may not have the ability to gain access to a voter ID, who have limited resources, can't drive themselves necessarily places. Um, but we've also seen efforts to suppress uh, the votes of college students. The governor of Texas now making it harder to vote by mail by, you know, making it uh, just only one drop box per county. What does that look like, though, in a place like Harris County? How, how will that affect the vote? It's going to be a detrimental part of any kind of democratic process. And that's why it's, it's really sad that this nation that it was at one point considering itself a leader of democracies around the world is undermining democracy right and left to maintain power. And so to have one drop box in a state like Texas, one drop box per county, and to do this in good conscience, and people get up and look at themselves in the mirror and call themselves an American, and to do something like this means that they're gonna be extra long lines, that there are going to be drop boxes that are so full you can't put your ballot in it. You're going to have more people who will give up and go home. And then you have to choose between your childcare, your job, your responsibilities for caring for your elders, all of these things to stand in line to vote. 
And so, of course, it's going to affect the masses of people and the masses of people are Democrats. And so this is done in order to undermine people who are going to vote for Joe Biden. Now, is there anything that can be done about this? Is it is it is there some sort of, you know, I, I know there's litigation happening all across the country right now, but is there something that um, can be done before election to fight this? And that goes back to litigation. It goes back to protests, doing exactly what you're doing right now. This is where the media is so important. Journalists are important because they tell the public what's going on. People outside of Texas may not know what's going on, but for journalists reporting on it. So thank you for that and bravo. But I would also say the litigation is important because a lot of litigation waits until after the election, but you don't really undo elections. Unfortunately, when they find out that there's been voter suppression, the person who wins based on voter suppression, and we saw this with Stacey Abrams in Georgia, still gets to stay in office, which is wholly unfair. So there has to be litigation leading up to that. And so what you have are injunctions. And then you, you bring a case and you ask a court to enjoin or stop um, the government or whatever the party is from doing this. Um, so there are ways in which the law can be used and also there can be um, legislation passed that will stop this from happening. And it's hard to pass legislation quickly, but sometimes it can be passed quickly to stop people from doing things that are a means to suppress the vote. Your organization also runs an election protection hotline. Um, for those who are not familiar, can you talk a little bit about that? What does it do? Who can call? How does it work? Uh, election protection is, um, it, it's the heart of our organization's work and a program that I'm really, really proud of. It's uh, been in place for 20 years. It's the nation's largest and longest running nonpartisan voter protection program. It's anchored by a hotline. It's uh, 866-OUR-VOTE, 866-OUR-VOTE, and you can call seven days a week. We have an army of over 20,000 lawyers, over 20,000 lawyers who are working day and night to troubleshoot and to help voters overcome any, any issue or obstacle uh, or question that they may have about voting in 2020. And that will do it for us. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment, share, and keep the conversation going. Let us know how we're doing. Shoot us an email. We're at cultureconversations at voxtv.com.